Welcome to today's event, which is co-hosted with Women's International Peace Center. This event is convened to mark the release of the second issue of WIPIC's Feminist Peace magazine, which is now available online in English and French, and we'll be putting the link in the chat box in due course. My name is Louise Arimazzo, and I'm a fellow based at the Center for Women, Peace and Security at the LSE, and a researcher on the Gender Peace Project funded by the European Research Council. Now, before we begin, a couple of housekeeping matters. This event is being live streamed on Facebook and will be recorded for future dissemination. Your mics have all been muted, but as, as, as time has actually been set aside to engage in a conversation with those of you who are present today, we hope that you will take the opportunity to share your views, your comments, and even post questions in the chat box throughout the event. In terms of format, we are joined by four speakers, three of whom contributed to the latest issue of the magazine. The format we adopt is slightly different from most in that we kick off with some words from, and it was supposed to be Juliet Ware, who's Deputy Executive Director of the Centre, but she was unable to join us. But instead, we have Susan, who is actually Head of Research Monitoring and evaluation, uh, the Evaluation Coordinator. And Susan has kindly agreed to share with us the kind of work that is being done by the Peace Centre as well as the thinking that went into and the ambitions of the magazine going forward. I will then return to introduce our speakers and invite them to speak to their work and their contributions to the magazine. Each of our speakers has been given or invited to speak for five to seven minutes. I will also be posing a number of open-ended questions hopefully to prompt a conversation among the speakers, but also with you in the audience. So Susan, am I correct in assuming that a core part of the Peace Centre's work right at the moment is not only research, but very much training to enable women from conflict affected zones to quote, amplify their voices in the fields of conflict prevention, peace building and women's rights. Is that the core um, work that you do at the center? Susan. Yeah. Yes, please. Thank you so much. Yes, you're right. Our core value is not only about research, but uh, we also do the peace building trainings. So I can take it on. So I can talk about the peace center, right? Oh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Louise. I'm Kinsey Suzanne, stepping in for Juliet. We are Women's International Peace Center that was founded in 1975. By then it was called ISIS, Women's International Cross-Cultural Exchange. Feminist organization that relocated from Switzerland, Geneva, to Africa, Uganda in, 19, in 1994. Um, for the past 27 years, with partners across 15 countries and post, both conflict and post-conflict African countries regionally, we aim at igniting women's leadership, amplifying voice and deepening their, act, their impact in recreating peace. The Peace Center has a homegrown model that looks at empowering women for peace by, by integrating research, documentation, holistic well-being, skills, movement building, as well as advocacy. Our vision, we visualize to see a world where women live in peace and recreate peace with core values of boldness, um, innovation, consistence, and intention of well-being. When we look at intentional well-being, we, we believe that we intentionally need to look at our bodies as women peace activists, so women defenders. So the model is we intersect research on women's specific experiences and needs, evidence-based advocacy to influence national, regional, and international policy, policies and practices 
holistic healing to enable women well-being and participation in peace processes, skills and movement building to equip women, women's human rights defenders with necessary skills, build networks, facilitate exchange of strategies to advance women's leadership for peace. Why we came up with a feminist peace series, the first, the first edition basically focused on what is feminist peace to the women. That's cross-cutting. We looked at all women, how do they understand peace from the, their own background, their own communities, their own uh, settings, right from the grassroots woman to the different women. That then the second uh, issue of uh, the feminist peace series. Here we looked at, we went to into the in depth. Now that there's COVID, the pandemic, how are we? How are the women living with peace amid this, this new changing dynamics? Um, looking at the health sector, how looking at that trauma healing. So the second, the second edition basically focuses on that in the nutshell, that's it. Thank you. Back to you, Louise. Thank you, Susan, for that sort of summary of some of the work that you're doing. I think it's, um, I, I just do have a couple of questions um, before we move on to, to um, the other speakers. One, how, how, many, how big is your centre? I mean, how many people are working full time with you? The full time staff, we have 20, we are 28 full staff. Well, wow, that's quite large, and so you and you have presence in quite a number of countries, I think, in the region. We have presence in South Sudan and uh, DRC. Okay. All right. Well, I, I think perhaps, you know, I hope you can stay with us until the end of the session, because I'm sure people in the audience will want to know a little bit more about the kind of work that you do, and they may indeed have questions that they'd like to post. Um, yes. So, as Susan mentioned, um, the topic for the second edition or the second issue of the Feminist Peace magazine was framed as crisis as an opportunity for transformative change. And essentially what we did was we asked people, contributors, um, to reflect on the implications of the global pandemic, but very much grounded, and this is what we kept on saying, grounded in the local and the personal, but also, and this is quite a complex exercise, framed by their conceptions of feminist peace. We were trying to do, you know, sort of to, to as I said, to ground it in experiences on the ground, but the experiences that, that the contributors also um, experienced themselves and witnessed as well, rather than, which is normal with a lot of the material that's around on COVID right now, looking at, at the, the, the um, position of women from that international level. So what we wanted to do was to go from the ground up. So it's a real pleasure to be able to welcome my next speaker, who is Margaret Lewilla who's actually program officer at WIPIC. Um, and in her essay, Margaret asks the question, and I think it's a really important question, how did we get here? Now, Margaret's essay contributes, as far as I can, in my opinion, um, contributes to a rich and growing body of what I call Pan-African Critical Feminist Scholarship that seeks to expose colonialism's violent legacies in the everyday practices of women's lives. And in her article, Margaret does so against the backdrop of COVID-19. So over to you, Margaret. Um, hello, everyone. And um, thank you, Louise, for that introduction. Um, as you've already mentioned, my name is Margaret Lowilla. I am a program officer at the Women's International Peace Center. I work in the South Sudan office. Um, so my contribution to this magazine, um, the title to my piece is Pursuing Feminist Peace Towards a More Equal um, Post-COVID-19 Future. So my piece is written in three parts. 
first I reflect on what the situation is. So that is um, the impact of COVID-19 and how we've been forced to confront a lot of the social inequalities that exist in our societies. So many have suggested that COVID-19 has been an equalizer. We've seen countries in the global north struggling um, to keep up with the rising number of infections. Um, meanwhile, in the national at the national level, um, lockdowns and travel restrictions have limited political leaders, for example, from accessing um, international health care. So they've had to seek medical services um, nationally. On the other hand, the pandemic has impacted people in differentiated ways as well. So depending on factors such as gender, social status, and geographical locations, um, lockdowns have caused the loss of livelihoods. They have caused uh, limited access to basic needs, including food, um, and the shift of the use of digital technology has also significantly highlighted the digital divide. More time um, has been spent during COVID-19 on unpaid domestic care, which is feminized and often invisible. Worse off are women living in poverty who carry a majority of the domestic work burden while receiving the least support. Um, in terms of the political sphere, I think COVID-19 has also instigated twin processes of repression and resistance. So pronounced inequalities um, and state inefficiencies in the provision of public goods and increased violence by armed forces um, charged with enforcing lockdowns was met with the rise of social movements demanding for accountability and justice from the government. In the second part of, of the essay, I reflect on the continent's colonial past um, and its legacies of capitalism, militarism, and patriarchy and patriarchy, um, which largely inform governance in the present day. Uh, the post-colonial African state is still rooted in unequal distribution of resources, sustained through the systemic exploitation of women, able-bodied youth, the urban poor, and rural populations. Furthermore, security forces continue to serve at the interests of the governing elite and are largely detached from the community and their needs. The post-colonial construction of the African woman's identity is also confined in the private sphere, in the private sphere, which has limited her participation in decision-making and in the economy. To date, women's labor is invisible and unpaid while they continue to be victimized by violence and excluded from wealth. In the third section, I look forward to the future and I propose that the COVID-19 crisis is also an opportunity to reimagine and recreate our societies towards feminist peace. Real progress will require the rejection of unequal hierarchical distributions of power and access to resources on one hand and the recentering of care and human security on the other. There has to be a collective recognition and acceptance of vulnerability and human interdependence and more investments need to be made into building trust and strengthening mutuality among populations. Thank you, Margaret, for that. Um, you know, I, I strongly urge everyone to read all these essays because I certainly learned a great deal from you. So thank you. I'm sure there will be questions to direct it at you um, in due course. Um, but what I want to do now is to move to our next speaker, um, Sabah Hamza, poet, writer, artist, activist, scholar. I mean, um, I, I use these um, descriptors tentatively because they tend to have the force of defining someone by those particular preconceived identities. But Sava is more than that. 
Now, Sabbath's poem, COVID PD, PTSD, together with a photograph, is actually included in this issue. And the poem is deeply personal, yet her words resonate and touch us and invite us to rethink our preconceptions around feminist peace in the midst of this pandemic. And perhaps the best, or in fact, the only way to do justice to Sabah's work is to actually share it with you. And so Sabah has agreed to read it for us, and I'm going to hand over to you, Sabah, but also to ask Sarah to put the poem and the photograph up on screen. So for those of you who prefer to read it or to follow Sabah's reading of it, there is for you. So over to you, Sabah. Um, thank you, thank you, Lewis, um, and uh, thank you for everyone for for attending. Um, I thought it was all over. The distances between us, the fear, the fighting, the forbidden, the veils, the borders, the boundaries, the pain. But Corona brought it all back. The distances, the lockdown the masks, the isolation, the fear. A new war, COVID isn't the only enemy. Trauma haunts fugitive women and ignite the body and the mind. One lesson I learned from all the wars I escaped, there is always, always, always a way to survive. Um, can I jump in here, Sava? Yeah, so thank you for that. Now, on first reading your poem, I was actually taken back to those days, those early days of the pandemic, when my world, perhaps our worlds, were turned upside down, when plans were shelved, when uncertainty and fear took hold, when time itself was stripped of meaning, and we lived from day to day, unable to contemplate the future simply surviving and gradually I for one had to relearn how to survive how to live a life and so I've read your reference to a way to survive to mean more than simply just getting by and I've also read the very production of your work exemplified by this poem as a demonstration of a particular mode of survival of feminist resistance. Perhaps you'd like to come back here. Perhaps you know you want to elaborate on your understanding and or my understanding of your poem. Yeah, thank you. Um, if I can ask just Sarah, please, to repost the, the photo and, and uh, the poem, but like basically the photo, if, if it could be there. Uh, yes, thank you. So um, actually the name of the poem is not there, but it is uh, CPTSD, which is COVID post-trauma disorder. Um, and I, as, as some of you could see here in the, in the poem, I used mostly words. So I, my usage for the, for the sentences was really limited. I used words. And I wanted to emphasize how can words shape our thinking um, because there was this moment when I was writing the poem, as you said, it's a personal, but it's also, it's also political to me um, because this way of survival and how, how these narratives of, you know, the, the binary narratives, uh, the post, and the, the and the P four so post trauma post coloniality post COVID, and while we are still there, so that's why I said there is always a way to survive. It's uh, it's not something that you you can get along with. It's just like you have to learn how to survive. Um, and I used um, we we talked before about how we used war here, how I reclaimed it. Um, and this is, it has also to do with a personal some, a story that happened, but it's this binary uh, separation between victim and survivor. So it's either you become a victim 
and you're being seen as a victim or you are uh, seen as a survivor. And Margaret put it very smartly just before, so I don't want to elaborate a lot on this. Um, but then how war was used during the COVID and how it was, you know, everyone was like, we're going through war, we're going through war, but women go a through a lot of wars and no one recognize what they do and how many wars they are surviving. So they're never mentioned any, any kind of, uh, or any type of, you know, peace processes in any uh, negotiations. And so the wars of the women are re not recognized as wars. They're, they usually talk about them as they talk like about violence, it's violence, it's violence. But uh, so they talk about, uh, let's say the disease, but they don't talk about the virus. So they talk about COVID, but they don't talk about Corona. And for, that's what they do with, with women, because if they talk about war, then there should be someone who's, who's invading, who's doing like this, the act. So that's why I try to use a lot of words, less sentences, because I don't want to speak a lot. I just wanted to, to highlight something. And then the photo as well, I used the light um, because it's, uh, yeah, no matter how, how I use words, sometimes the light can, uh, can bring more depth uh, into, yeah, the emotions that I want to elaborate on. Um, and when I took this photo, the first thing that I saw was, was actually the virus. <laughs> so, and, um, yeah, it's, it's, this is how they depicted to us at the beginning of the Corona. It was something like whenever we see, yes, it's terrifying, but at the same time, there is kind of beauty. Um, and yeah, I don't know if I answered your question, but <laughs> I tried to. <laughs> There was no question there. No, thank you. Um, it's interesting because, you know, again, I, I had a couple of other questions that I wanted to pose. Um, and it touches on something that you've just said. And, you know, it's, it's, it's one that I've struggled with. How do we recognize, okay, let alone register and divine the gendered and racialized violence of the everyday, which has no name? And if it cannot name, how then do we begin to address it? And I think this is something that you know I, I really do struggle with, um, and uh, especially as a lawyer, because I need to name it to be able to address it. Um, and yet, it, it has no name often, and certainly not in law. And this is what I get between the lines of reading your poetry and looking at your images. Um, that, 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 that there are no boundaries, that the binaries that we get so used to. And everything about our life prior to COVID, which was so structured, was almost exploded by COVID. You know, nothing made any sense. And sometimes it still doesn't. Um, and yet, you know, sort of we struggle. And to a certain extent, I think, you know, that, that, that this is also exemplified, you know, the, the, in the feminist movements across the world, that in the midst of a pandemic, what we've witnessed across the globe is an unprecedented level of feminist resistance. And we can see it on the streets and we can see it in the writings. Um, and, you know, again, I have a whole series of subset questions. What can we draw from this? Is what we're witnessing a moment of radical change, that we cannot go back? Or is it, God forbid, a return? Because certainly, elites are pressing for return and even a regressive move, you know, in the direction that is not conducive to feminist peace. Yeah, it's actually, yeah, it's uh, what you said at the beginning as, as being a lawyer and that it's important to name it. And I do agree that it's important to name it, but how many violence, like viola violations women are exposed to that we need to name. And here comes the intersectional theory where it can it can somehow help us to know how, how you know the the intersectionality of gender and race um, and religion and all these different different layers um, to kind of understand because not only women because now we can't even define who is a woman who's not but not only women are exposed to these kinds of violences so 
in some places in, in the world, women and men are exposed to the same kind of violence that other people in other places, let's say in the in the north of, of the world, like they're not exposed even to, even women are not exposed to such violent violences. Um, so, and, and that's why where I said the power of words and naming things where one word can actually mean different things and different things can mean one thing. So when we say Corona, COVID, blah, 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 and it's not only the power of word, but it's also the power dynamics of the politicians, of, uh, of the educators, of all those people and how they try to set, you know, um, the, the um, imagination of the populations of people or whoever to a certain thing. So at the beginning we were hearing like Corona, 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 and then they were like, yeah, if it's, if it's Cyrus, let's say, then some people in other places in the world would be really terrified because in Asia and other places, COVID, um, Corona Cyrus killed a lot of people. So then they changed the name into COVID. So it's not just like an innocent process. It is sometimes it's good, but also naming things can actually deviate us from, yeah, you know, from the violence that happens to other people or to other groups. Uh, but I really, what, what I would really care about is recognizing the violence more than naming it because it, it comes with different shades, with different shades, with different, yeah. So, uh, but I, I know this is like, it's easier for an artist than for a lawyer. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Sabo, what I'm going to do is you, you will definitely get questions and even comments about your work. Um, so what I'm going to do is now turn to our third and last speaker, um, Sharon Berryu, who is, Communication Officer with WIPIC. Now, I have had the privilege over the last six months to work very closely with Sharon in her capacity as the co-editor of this magazine. She was my guide throughout this process and I could not have had a better teacher. In her essay, Sharon focuses on Uganda, but what she's extraordinarily adept at doing is bridging that divide between theory and practice, between critique and policy, which may be core to feminist politics, but it's not necessarily a skill that we all possess. We have to work at it. So on that note, Sharon, over to you. Thank you so much, Louise. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for the launch of our second edition of the Feminist Peace Series. Um, my article talks about, it looks at what does feminist peace and peaceful COVID-19 recovery mean in Uganda. Well, uh, the article discusses the current situation in the country and the measures that must be introduced to ensure full uh, COVID-19 recovery moving forward. Um, one of the things that I look at in the article is women as first responders to COVID-19. We see that at the community level, uh, women are already vital leaders in the pandemic response. Uh, we see them caring for people who become sick, ensuring uh, there's food for their families, organizing for communities and, and many more. And also uh, some of these women are also activists within their communities who understand deeply and specifically the needs um, of the people in the community. So um, Uganda, in the um, since the outbreak of the pandemic, um, Uganda set up COVID-19 task forces at the district level and at the national level. But then we realized that um, most of these COVID task forces did not have women. Um, and most of the decisions that were being made were excluding women. So uh, one of the things that uh, I propose the government should do is one, ensure that uh, women are given leadership roles um, in the COVID-19 task force and to ensure that they include at least 50% of women. Um, and not just women, but then in all their diversities from the grassroots uh, to civil society, and those who are at the forefront of the COVID-19 um, response. And we must ensure that these women have the space to offer their expertise to shape policy responses. Uh, we also see that uh, long before the pandemic, um, grassroots feminists worldwide um, have grappled with the need to meet urgent needs while simultaneously working um, towards long-term systemic solutions. So learning from these approaches, uh, policymakers can implement emergency relief efforts uh, whether distributing food or providing uh, health information while setting the stage for long-term recovery. Uh, this means continually reasserting the need for a shift in the values driving our policies and amplifying um, women's needs um, in the community. 
Uh, the other thing we also look at is uh, violence against women and girls. Since the outbreak of COVID-19, um, emerging data and reports uh, from those at the front line have shown that uh, all types of violence against women and girls have intensified across the globe. Um, and according to the 2020 Uganda Police Post Annual Crime Report, we saw 17 uh, 17,666 cases of domestic violence that were reported to the authorities compared to the 13,693 in 2019. This represents a 29% increase. Uh, we also noticed, um, well, in the, in the annual crime report, there were also 418 murders that were reported involving domestic violence um, compared to the 360 cases in 2019. That also shows a 16.1% increase. Um, so we see that this increase is attributed to the lockdown period aimed at curbing the spread of the virus. Um, and also we see that 8.2% of the crimes reported in 2020 were termed as sex-related crimes. Uh, these were 16,144 cases and an increase of 3.8% compared to the previous year. Um, one of the things I proposed here is that the Ugandan authorities must ensure that women and girls are provided with meaningful opportunities to one, participate in decision making on all aspects of program policy and implementation to ensure that GBV prevention, response and coordination approaches can be carried in a way that is context specific, suitable and adapted to the gender dimension of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, short and long-term um, sexual and gender-based violence services should also be prioritized and categorized as life-saving due to the negative and often life-threatening impacts of STDs on individuals, uh, their families, social cohesion, and economic stability. Um, the government of Uganda should des designate domestic violence shelters as essential services and, and increase resources to all providers, including civil society groups on the front line, of response and ensure continuity of essential services, such as um, access to safe bath, antenatal and postnatal care, and immunization programs. Um, uh, by previous speaker, Saba, in her poem, she refers to COVID-19 as a new war. And in the past, we've seen that Ugandan government has channeled most of its public funds on militarizing its response to the pandemic rather than protecting the people. We'd see, um, when the first case uh, was reported in 2019, March last year, the first thing they did was impose curfew and the curfew was militarized. We had LDUs roaming the streets in the evenings. And if you're found outside past curfew time, you are either beaten or arrested. And to, to get out of it, you basically had to pay a bribe. So um, the state's continued use of warlike language to describe its response to the pandemic is quite problematic. It indicates that we as a nation think that the best way to handle the situation is to cause fear and panic among citizens. You know, you think that by bringing out guns and having the military roam in the streets, you think that that's the only way we're going to be able to obey. And, um, and with that, um, Uganda also has a delicate history of conflict. Uh, the past couple of years, especially Northern Uganda, um, is just recovering from uh, the Lord Resistance Army conflict. And uh, we realize that the government has been reluctant to deliver redress to victims uh, for rights violations perpetrated during that conflict. So with the militarization of the pandemic, we realize that lots of people are being re-traumatized and other mental health issues are being raised as an impact of you know, militarizing the pandemic. So uh, to address this, the government was, must work um, both in the short and long term by creating an open, inclusive and transparent process to shape their efforts at mobilizing support to address the pandemic processes. Pro uh, this process needs to move beyond just including experts, but also include groups that have thus been far marginalized during the conflict recovery process. This includes women, children, youth, everyone who, are, who was affected by the armed conflict needs to be able to, the government needs to provide redress. Um, we also look at um, economic recovery. Um, the effects of the pandemic have spilled over to the economy. The different phase lockdowns um, have affected people's businesses and people have not been able to fully recover from the process. Just when uh, they lift a lockdown and your business is trying to get back on its feet, uh, they impose another lockdown and then you're back to square one. So this leaves a lot of people with really no um, specified um, avenue to get income. So a lot of people are hustling to get the money that they need to survive. So you're living from hand to mouth. 
every single day. Like the little money that you get, you have to feed your family, provide a basic needs, food, be able to provide health care, and yeah, all those. Um, we also saw that um, during, well, since the outbreak of the pandemic, the World Bank has provided over 300 million US dollars to support, um, to help mitigate the economic impact of the pandemic and uh, protect the poor and vulnerable populations. And well, uh, the government tried to utilize this money, but it hasn't really, um, it didn't really reach the targeted people. Um, in around July, the government decided to roll out, uh, to distribute money to the vulnerable population, which included people who are living in the slums and so on. And they were supposed to give them 100,000 shillings. But even this money alone is not enough to provide for you know, the basic care needs. It's like the money was just budgeted for buying food. And the other things, well, you just have to think about it and find other means to be able to cater for yourself. So as uh, COVID-19 continues to spread across the country, um, the absence of um, social safety nets needed by women due to their greater fiscal precarity in the face of economic shocks has exposed the failures of a development trajectory currently prioritizing productivity for growth over the well-being of Ugandans. Um, something else that has, uh, COVID-19 has also crippled the healthcare system um, in the country. We realize that um, many women and girls um, who already have limited access to healthcare services uh, have even had more difficult to access the services during this period. So, um, so access to healthcare um, has been uh, diminished due to lack of um, income to buy vital medicines and seek healthcare. Um, when the second wave um, hit the country, we noticed that a lot of private hospitals were obscenely charging um, people who got sick uh, money for treatment. You know, there was a lot of scrub and petition for oxygen tanks. And if you went to a hospital, the bill was like way higher than, you know, previously before. And then we saw like so many people started resorting to um, home treatments, taking um, their herbs and to try and, and, and treat themselves and recover from the pandemic. So even the, the high cost of healthcare itself during the period really um, affected the citizens. So the government needs to work smarter to support the health response by reducing the cost of the necessary medicine, um, medical materials and equipment to prevent uh, manage and treat COVID-19. Um, in addition, critical utility services must be maintained and the most vulnerable are uh, more effectively protected uh, by taking into account the poverty impact of the crisis. Um, in the past couple of months, we've also been seeing um, so many different doses of the COVID-19 vaccine have been coming into the country. And uh, well, at the moment, we only have 2,688,361 people who have been vaccinated. This is, this is not even a quarter of the population. And yet, uh, in, during the different presidential addresses, um, the president says um, this will not open unless this number of people have been vaccinated. And currently, only about 2 million have been vaccinated. So the government needs to enhance and more expeditiously roll out its vaccination program, including through community outreaches. Messages on vaccination against COVID should be translated to the different languages. A lot of people, um, they, need to know the, uh, they need to know the side effects um, of the vaccine. There are different vaccines out there. So uh, the side effects might be different depending on the individual. You know, when you go and get vaccinated, there's usually a consent form that you have to sign. Um, and this consent form is usually in English. I remember when I was going to get um, when I was going to get vaccinated, um, I saw a number of people who um, weren't well spoken in English having trouble understanding what the consent form meant. And the health uh, the healthcare workers who are in the in the in the vicinity were not even helping them translate. They would just show you, oh, write your name here, sign here, and sign here. And then later on, someone goes back home, they feel feverish, and then they think that they have gotten COVID-19 and yet these are just the side effects of uh, the vaccine. So these are some of the things that uh, the Ministry of Health together with the government needs to properly explain to the citizens so that uh, when, when the citizens are aware of the effects and know the benefits of the vaccine as well, we'll have more people going to get vaccinated. Otherwise, all these vaccines that are being donated to the country will just be stashed somewhere and 
they'll probably get expired without people getting vaccinated. Um, so in conclusion, um, the cascading effects of COVID-19 um, are yet to be fully uncovered and appreciated. Well, there's no way we're going to go back to the normal as a lot of us are saying, oh, I can't wait for things to get back to normal. We now just have to move forward. And the, uh, this crisis currently provides a critical window of opportunity to build more effective, inclusive and resilient systems. Uh, women and girls, especially those with intersectional characteristics are particularly disadvantaged during situations of instability and upheaval due to the structures of oppression, power relations and social norms that prevent them from accessing basic care services, including healthcare and education and participating in decision-making processes that affect their lives. Um, consequently, they also face higher risks of falling into poverty, dropping out of school, and experiencing hunger and malnutrition. You notice that, you know, with the lockdown, schools have barely been opened, and so many students um, are staying home. And it's only the privileged ones who have access to smartphones and can, can access the internet who have been able to continue studying. But what happens to those who are in the rural communities who don't have access to, you know, televisions for these um, online classes, or even smartphones, or even a laptop? someone even doesn't have a radio to be able to listen to a class. As um, a couple of months ago, um, the government uh, tried to roll out um, classes via the through radio programs, but well, that also didn't keep off. So um, uh, to this end, uh, the government needs to design comprehensive systems from a gender and intersectional perspective. These systems should include policies that provide universal good quality public services and resources and infrastructure to meet the different care needs of the population. That's it. Thank you so much. Uh, back to you, Louise. Thank you so much, Sharon. Um, so I think if the government of Uganda was devoid of any ideas, you have a host of um, recommendations that they might consider taking up. Um, I, uh, before I move on to the audience to see whether there are any um, comments or, or questions, um, there is something that I do want to pick up on, and it's something that, in fact, links all your pieces. Um, you use the word, you know, sort of the, the, the notion of returning to normality, um, simply return, okay, and how that's impossible. But those who use that language, I find, are already the ones who are already privileged, because why would you want to return to what was normal if you were homeless, if you were, you know, sort of starving, if you were were in a situation of violence already, okay, a return is the same language. So when I hear people use these words, you know, I think we need to um, pause for a moment and think about context. And this kind of plays in to what Saba, you were saying earlier, but also very much Margaret, if I can bring you in here too, um, you know, the, and I, I do want to explore more this, this idea of resistance to return and the, the feminist movements. Have you seen, okay, whether it's in Uganda or in your day-to-day -day work, any shift, okay, at the local level um, that, that, is, that, that is asking or demanding not return, not back to normal, but something more than that is outside your circle of people that you have traditionally engaged with. Margaret, would you like to come back in here? Or indeed, Saba? Have I lost you guys? No, you're there. No, we're still here. Yes. Um, yeah. Actually, I, I told before when I wrote the poem that it was indeed personal and we, when I used the words war in particular, and actually I was attending this class for uh, on conflict studies and we had this white guy with us who was like, you know what, now we are all in war. And I'm, I'm sure that people in Africa are going through a lot, but it's different, like this is also a war that we're going through. And I was like, yes, of course, course you're going through war sitting in your apartment you know um using all the privileges from the government like you have your food you have your electricity you have everything and I'm sure you want to, as Sharon said you want to go back to normal to end this war that you're going through uh, but my my family for example in Yemen they, they don't even see the shift you were asking about the shift they don't see the shift so they are going through the war I, I told him that you are now going through 
but the, they don't even recognize it because what they're going through is much worse. So that's when I felt irritated that the word war what was using in this context, because it, it, it came to a point where people started to compare in a way and to lose, not to lose, but not to be accountable, you know, to what's happening in other places in the world, where what's happening in Africa and Middle East and other places is not something that those people are, you know, to be held accountable for. It's, it's actually, uh, yeah, it's capitalism, it's post-coloniality, coloniality that I can't even say post because we haven't yet finished, <laughs> right? So, it's yeah it's also what you highlighted it's the return is is to a privileged position but those people didn't even recognize that yeah they didn't see something that they yeah or let's say they didn't lose something to say like ah okay we really need to go back to it it's just like it's something it's a new burden on them so yeah it's it's just okay. terrifying this these notions how they can do and, and and how people can just like use them so easily to claim yeah privileged positions. Margaret, can I bring you in back in here? Are you there with us? Yes. Margaret, any would you like to to share your views on this? Um yes, I think I can add a bit on what Saba has said. Um Again, the, the COVID crisis highlighted things that were already there, right? The inequalities were, were already there. The violence was already there, but because of the crisis, it, it pronounced everything and everything was more exaggerated. Um, before COVID-19, citizens were still experiencing, for example, police brutality maybe it was not as visible to some of us but then a lot of people in the poorer communities were experiencing that but now because the police are are being charged with enforcing lockdowns we are all experiencing it so we've been kind of brought in to really confront all of the um for lack of a better word, all of the ugliness of what has been existing in our society. There is no way we can go back. <laughs> We've, we have now, we have seen it, we have experienced it. There is just, there is no way. And I think the crisis has, has just made the call for change more urgent. Now we must change because this is just, we can't le live in these conditions and we also can't ignore it. We can't pretend like we haven't seen it. It's, it's in our faces, we're dealing with it every day and now we must find solutions to be better, to do different. Um, and yeah, there's, there's really an opportunity here to change the way we've done things because the way we've done things, it's just, it's not going to work anymore. Sharon, did, did you want to jump in here too again? Yes, um, I thought I would add to what Margaret said about um, changing, um, uh, well, to shift our perspectives. And I think one of the things that would help us do that is documenting our experiences, what women at the grassroots are doing to combat COVID-19, but, but also build peace in their communities. The more we document these experiences and what's happening with COVID-19, uh, and for future crises that might happen, we should be able to learn from what is happening now and hope that what will be implemented in the future will be different because we don't want another crisis to come along and then we're like, oh, um, the, the health systems are crippled, you know, um, lockdown has been enforced and the, the economy is also crippled, you know. So we need to have alternatives to all the things that are happening. If you enforce a lockdown, um, what are the alternatives for the citizens to to, to earn a living, are you going to be providing a monthly stipend uh, to, for them to be able to cater for their basic needs? Um, is there going to be more accessible healthcare services uh, for, for women? I remember uh, at the beginning of the lockdown, so many women um, 
died because of um, they couldn't get access to some of the health facilities to give birth and some of them gave birth along the way and by, by the time you couldn't use borders not even cars were being allowed and some of these places don't have even ambulances so you find people having to walk very long distances to get to the hospitals and then you find someone has given birth along the way and even when they try to use the border border those are the, the motorbikes a police officer stops you and they say that oh you're violating the COVID-19 standard operating procedures. So to get out, out of it, you find yourself, even with the little money that you have, that is probably supposed to pay for your bill at the hospital, you're using it to bribe this officer so that you're able to get to the hospital to give birth. But then when you get there, there's no medicine or um, the nurses the, or the midwives are not enough to attend to you. There's so many people and all the things just keep piling up and worsening the situation that already existed. So I believe that um, the more we document, we shall be able to learn uh, from our past and also uh, incorporate some of these things in the present and in the future to, able to, to, to be able to see a change. Yeah. Thank you, Sharon. You actually took the words right out of my mouth because can I direct that, what you've just said, back to Margaret and or Sather, because you know, my question really is, if crisis does present an opportunity for change rather than return, how should we as feminists engage with the past, the present, and the future? Is that a horrible question for either of you? For Margaret, go for it. <laughs> um, sorry, I actually just um, wanted to highlight something. When Sharon was when Sharon was talking and she spoke about um, the health institutions um, and documentation, I think there really is an opportunity to also look at the innovations that have come during this time. Um, so I was engaged in, in, in research on the impact of COVID-19 on women's peace and security in South Sudan. Um, and some of the things that came up was, you know, because the health institutions did not have the capacity, there was a lot of communities going back and kind of using herbs to help improve their situation, right? And I think there's an opportunity to look at how, how communities have adapted in this moment and the innovations that have come, because then we can learn from that um and it can inform and improve um our healthcare systems so that we're not just looking at things within within one system or one frame of mind there are things and there are innovations that have come out of this so just to emphasize sharon's point that we do need to do the research and to document so that as we are moving forward um we can learn from these things. Yes. Yeah. Saba, I see you nodding. Would you like to come in? Um, yeah, it's just like I, I do agree with what uh, both of them said, because if we want to engage with the past, with present and future, then there should be a story that we engage with. And I, I think I realized that very early in my age, but also during the exile, like, journey that I call it the exile journey started in 2015 and I how I started documenting my own story and it came from this position where I realized that a lot of the past of my ancestors was was not actually documented so we couldn't engage with the past we couldn't engage with the violence that, that they were exposed to uh, the the only few things that I could engage with were stories like oral stories told by you know by grandmothers and and you know, by old people, but that was it. Um, so as an educator, that's what I emphasize all the time to my students when they ask about, oh, but I don't know how to write a poem. I don't know how to write a story. It's just like, write it down. It's your story. No one can tell you how to write it. And if no one recognizes it as literature, they can recognize it at any moment as something valuable that that is really adding to the community because then we can act like we can learn from it so if it wasn't recognized now as as let's say literature it can be recognized as history that helps us to go really like forward to the future 
So uh, yeah, that's what I wanted also to emphasize on that documentation is really, really important. Okay, so I can't thank you for that, Sabah. Um, and I do want to end on those very notes. Um, I have also had my eye on the chat box, and I haven't actually had any questions. Um, I really did want to to bring the audience in here, but you know, um, maybe they'll. But I, th I think perhaps they need to read what you've all written and reflect on it and have that time to reflect on it and think about it before they can do justice to um, having a, a conversation with you. Um, and so maybe we'll have another event like this in the future. Um, what was what I do want to end with is this, this because you all seem to me to adopt what I think is very feminist and maybe that's, that's just in our nature um, approach to um engaging with what's going on um in quite a distinct way which is framed by a respect for an understanding of and a longing to learn from our histories okay a, a, a vision of the possibilities of societies that are structured in radically different way um and and you know, it's, it's the, the ability to take your skills, your craft, um, whether it's through your, your, your um, work as advocates, whether it's through your training programs, um, your activism more broadly, or the work that you produce, to take that as inspiration or for that to be inspiration from your lived realities, but also then to turn that into inspiration for feminist peace. And that I think is um, what distinguishes you all from some of the other work that I've seen around you know, sort of responses to COVID. So um, I'm hoping that my audience is going to join me in thanking you all for, for sharing um, your, your insights, your views, your ideas today. And um, I do encourage our audience, first of all, I thank our audience for joining us, but to, to go to the chat, I think Sarah's posted the link to, to um, the magazine itself um, and to engage with um, pieces in the magazine because um, you will be glad for having spent time to read them. So thank you very much all for joining us today and thank you to our panelists. Thank you, Saba, thank you, Sharon, and thank you, Margaret, and also thank you, Susan, for stepping in at the last moment. Thank you all. Thank you, Louise.